It's my pleasure to present uh, Senator Barker, who represents Fairfax County, and the wonderful teacher he's been working with, uh, Kathy Buffin. And they're going to talk a little bit about their relationship and how they're getting uh, their students involved uh, in the legislative process. Wonderful program. So, Senator and Kathy, thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Ruffing, and I have to come clean and say I actually um, just retired from Fairfax County after 27 years in June. So you can applause, but I really, really miss it. I'm actually really jealous of you all being in the classroom for this election and everything that's going on. And the I taught AP government and law, um, AP government for all 27 years, and um, and I'm I'm feeling very sort of jealous of not being in the classroom for this. And now I'm in an organization um, called Street Law, which maybe some of you know of. Actually. Actually, she was an AP government all 27 years. She, she taught my daughter an IB government that's at true. Mount Vernon High School. So That's true. I taught AP and IB that year. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we came to know each other, but um, we actually didn't know that when we started working together until, until a little bit later. Um, so we're going to talk today about some, like, the practical part of action civics. And as Delegate Dillard said, it's it's a shame that we only do state and local government for you know a week at the end of the year or two weeks at the end of the year. So um, what this program did was allowed us to interweave it throughout the entire year and actually have an authentic audience for student work, which we all know makes a big difference um, in how students and how much students bring to the table when they know it's going to be seen outside of just handing it in and getting a grade. Um, and I will let Senator Barker introduce himself, although I will say I did get to teach his lovely daughter at Mount Vernon High School. Right, Go Majors. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Senator George Barker and represent parts of Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William County. And um, actually what happened was the head of the, the uh, Social Studies Department, government uh, teacher, at Centerville High School, uh, the year that I was running for the first running for the Senate in 2007, I'd run previously for the House of Delegates, but it only took me 16 years to get elected. So, but in 2007, I did unseat uh, uh, the same guy who'd beaten me twice before. He had already agreed to work with the school to uh, do a program, so they said, "Well, so, since he lost, you're it." So, uh, so I didn't have too much choice and stepped right in the first year. And what we've done is every year that I've been in the General Assembly, this is my 11th uh, year this year. Uh, what we've done every year is the students, the government students in teams uh, in each class work on coming up with ideas for a bill for me to submit in the legislature. Uh, and out of those, they then present those in class and everything. And they end up being, and, and then each of the classes ends up selecting one, uh, one uh, proposal to, to go on to competition for uh, what bills would be selected. Uh, my, I and my staff then review the options that are out there, and each year I've put in a bill uh, drafted, that was drafted by the uh, students in, at, in the government program at uh, Centerville High School. And uh, what they do then is, uh, weather permitting, and we have had a few weather challenges here and there, uh, they come down uh, at least once during the General Assembly session to uh, help present the bill when it goes before committee. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the General Assembly, at least in the Senate side and sometimes in the House side, I'll, although frequently by the time we're getting to the House side, things are happening so fast you don't know till you know, 6 p.m. the night before that you gotta, you're going to be presenting it the next day, and that, so that hasn't always worked out. And, uh, but what they've pre so they've really had a great time with that, and they certainly are excited, and a lot of the teams have done extraordinary jobs presenting it. Uh, also, uh, what they, but I think what they like the most is when they actually get a bill passed, and some of them have passed, not all of them, but some of them have passed, because uh, then I bring them down when the governor ceremonially signs the bill and everything. So it's, it's a big event. But, uh, yeah. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kathy and sort of the, some yeah, of the can, educational we can things. Share. Okay. This one's right, yeah. Oh, okay. okay, so um, we're gonna try to play for you, although we have some, we're gonna have to um, do a little audio MacGyvering here. Um, are you pulling it up? Um, I, the uh, little spot that WJLA did on last year's bill, um, although since we just heard about media literacy, I will point out that they got one thing at least wrong in this story, and that 
the students that um, whose bill was selected last year were all AP students, but that was um, it doesn't always happen that way. And the project is open, not open. Every senior um, in government does this project, so they keep reporting. I think the first um, the first media outlet reported that it was it was a project in their AP government classes, but all government students did this regardless of level. We're going to see if we can watch the WJLA spot. Starting this summer, a new law takes effect, making it mandatory for Virginia 911 call centers to accept text messages in emergencies. As Kelly Lynn tells us in tonight's Spotlight on Education, that law wouldn't exist without legislation created by high school students in Clifton. 911, what is the address of your emergency? When an emergency strikes, calling 911 isn't always the safest approach. You don't want to be heard if you're in a dangerous situation, so it's easier to just text 911. Texting 911 will soon be possible throughout the state of Virginia thanks to the work of these Centerville High School students. Their assignment in AP government class was to create a bill that could become law. It just had to like meet basic requirements like not be very expensive, be able to make a difference and, and be relevant. The small group of students crafted a bill that would make it mandatory for Virginia 911 call centers to receive text messages. What I wanted to do was let students realize they have a voice in government. Their teacher embraced the idea, as did Virginia State Senator George Barker, who introduced the text to 911 bill to the Virginia General Assembly. The Senate Bill 418. To go through the whole process myself really like opened my eyes to what it's like to live in a democracy. The high school seniors testified before the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. Lawmakers gave their support and so did the governor. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam signed the bill which will become law on July 1st. Now to know that like everyone throughout Virginia will be able to do this soon like text 911 if they're ever in a dire situation, it's good to know that everyone can be safe. Fairfax County 911. In Clifton, Kelly Lynn, ABC 7 News. Sorry, I miss, I have a little lump in my throat right now. This is me. Trying not to get emotional. Um, yeah, so I was, that was not me in that video. That was my co-teacher. I was at, um, I was in Salt Lake City greeting AP exams. So having all sorts of fun. Um, okay, that's okay. That's okay, we'll go on without that for a second. Um, so that was last year's bill that was, uh, the, that was successful. We've only had two bills um, get, get through the House, the Senate, or the Senate first, then the House, and get signed by the governor in one calendar year with the same students still at school. But that's a pretty good record, and two out of the last three years. So we'll go with that record. And, and we have had several that I was unable to get past uh, in both cases, some of the cases in the House, at least, the first year, but we're able to get them in uh, subsequent years. Okay, so if we're going to talk about the steps to this project, and I know that a lot of you are civics teachers, but you're going to see um, that what the students actually did was not um, super sophisticated and probably outside the realm of what your civics students could try to do. Um, and you also could do it at a, in a little smaller scale, maybe with something like a school board initiative or something like that, or a local town um, ordinance, as it wouldn't have to be a, a state law. But the first thing is the strong working relationship between Senator Barker's office and Centerville High School and I think this started out as a cold call so when we first started this project so it was with your your predecessor but um, it was just a, a cold call to say hey we're interested in this and then Senator Barker was kind enough when he came into the um, into the mix to pick it up um, but I think a big part of it is the communication between Senator Barker's office and us for as far as um, deadlines um, and you might want to talk a little bit about that and his needs as far as the kind of things that he might be interested in and then um, communicating that to our students so I'll let you say from your side of the Sure. Actually, uh, the, the deadlines is, is a pretty easy piece because we have certain deadlines in terms of when we need to get drafts of bills in and everything. So that gives them some framework and they're able to, uh, to work with that, to work with the students to come up with the ideas on things. And sometimes when I haven't gotten all the information by the time of deadline, uh, I'll submit two or three of the options in there, have them all drafted, but then end up just submitting one of those as uh, legislation to move forward through, uh, through the assembly. Uh, we, one of the things that's important is for students to understand what their, what their objective is here. 
And part of what I've tried to explain to them when I've uh, met with some of the students sometimes, and you saw it a little bit in one of the statements from one of the students there, pick something that is, uh, has some significant benefit. It's just not, not just a frivolous type of, a, of idea you might have on things. Something that uh, can make a difference uh, in, in the community. Something that uh, you think has a, a real chance of passing and something that's not going to uh, suddenly show up with a $100 million price tag. Uh, you know, if you do one of, the, one of those things where you uh, uh, come up with a, something that's extraordinarily expensive, it may be a great idea, but we're not likely to have enough money to be able to, in one year, be able to address that. And so the students have sort of backed down from some of those types of things uh, and come up with a lot of good ideas that are worthy of consideration and do have a good chance for passing. Uh, this past year, it did help very much that the chairman of the committee, as soon as he heard the bill presented, thought it was a great idea. So he started lobbying the other members of the committee to get it, uh, get it passed, and it went, went through unanimously on things. One of the things you find when you're working with students is uh, they're often looking for something that has relevance to them and their peers. So uh, a lot of the bills they come up uh, with have something to do with driving or something to do with teen driving uh, types of things. Uh, I mean, this wasn't quite that, but it did, certainly deals with some situations where there, someone needs to be able to get in touch with 911, but is afraid afraid of being overheard if they do it on, uh, you know, just uh, on, on talking on the phone, and so that's why they want to do do a text. Yeah, and let me just say, so so too, the young lady that you saw speaking, um, she was my student, and she one of the things I told them to do, and it's up there on the slide, is to look for things in the headlines, like open your eyes and ears to the news. And so she was on Facebook and she saw a story about um, a young woman who was abducted and she was texting her boyfriend. She was afraid to call 911 because she was in the, in the back of the car and she was texting her boyfriend and he thought she was joking. And so he's texting back, ha ha, very funny. And so finally she convinced him, and, but by the time, and all's well that ends well, she, was, she came out of it okay. But so that's where she got this idea. And then as they started to research, they also found out that the hearing impaired community really cared deeply about this topic. And then um, really ripped from the headlines, they found out as they looked further that um, in the Virginia Tech shootings that students were trying to text 911, but that that county did not have text to 911 service. So they were texting their friends and their family elsewhere. So you can imagine you're in Fairfax and you're getting a text from your child who is in an active shooter situation and you're, um, you call 911, but you're getting connected to Fairfax County 911. So it's, you know, it, it, there was, a, there was a, a, a time lapse there that was crucial moments. Um, and so they took these ideas from the headlines. The other things that I tell them to do that's up there is to um, actually talk to their parents, which you know because you teach, um, they don't do. But think about what your parents do for a living. You know, like my husband's an environmental consultant, right? So he knows about environmental things, and I'm a teacher, so I know about that. And so, you know, ask your parents, your neighbors, think about um, who you have in your life who are experts at things that might be able to guide you. Um, and between that, we are able to get them to get some pretty good topics. So the next step is to com actually compose the bill. And this is the picture of the actual bill on when, our, when my students went down to the committee hearing. But this is not what it looks like when they write it just so you know. <laughs> um, when they write it, it looks more like, well, we'll talk about what they do first. First of all, they write like why they did the bill, what the purpose of the bill is, a little bit about um, their research, why the bill is needed, and why this is the right solution for the bill. And then, as Senator Barker said, um, cost. We try to explain to them that they can't eat the elephant in one bite. You know, they all want to do things, and these never make it to Senator Barker, so I'll talk about these. They get filtered. <laughs> they all want to have a homeless shelter for every homeless person in Virginia, and they all want to have everybody who has a 3 0 or higher gets free college education, right? And those are worthy, great ideas, and you don't want to crush their idealism, but, you know, Senator Barker can't take that to the Senate. He can't propose that. Um, so, so this is what we ask them to do. This is what it looks like when Senator Barker is done with it. So I'll let him speak, but the red is what my students actually wrote. This little tiny bit of red down here, and by the way, not in that legalese either. Um, everything else came from Senator Barker's office. So I'll let him talk about what happens once um, we send some ideas. 
Uh, one, of the thing, one of the great things the students do is they do the research on this. So that when uh, I'm presented, uh, my staff is presented with a, a proposal uh, for a bill, uh, it comes with not only what they want to accomplish here and what they're, the language that they're proposing uh, to address it, uh, but the, docu the documentary background research. And so that's where we got information on the hearing community, on uh, people who had been adopted, you know, those types of things, on when it was a significant issue. Uh, and then what we do sometimes is follow up to get additional information uh, to be able to determine some things like relative feasibility, what the situation is in Virginia. And this time we were able to get, uh, through my office, to be able to get the information as to how many 911 systems in Virginia have texting capability already. Uh, it's actually not that difficult, uh, and it actually does not cost significantly because, as the students uh, found in their research, uh, there's already precedent in terms of uh, the requirement being placed upon the, the uh, cell, phone, uh, cell phone operators. Uh, they provide the funding to help the, the uh, local 911 systems be able to install it. It's not particularly expensive, but what this does is make sure that it takes away that argument that each of them have. Uh, however, even though it, it can be done with no upfront cost in terms of equipment or anything at all the 911 systems in Virginia, you might be surprised that the majority, so substantial majority of the 911 systems in Virginia, at least as of January and February this year, did not have texting ability to receive texts. Uh, part of it was that they were, uh, in some cases, not sure it was that significant. Uh, in other cases, they were afraid, well, if we accept tests, we're just going to be overwhelmed with texts and we're going to have to hire more people because it takes more time to respond to the text than just someone who's calling 911. Uh, so what we were able to do was to deal with all those uh, issues and be able to present information uh, there to counteract that. And what we were then able to do was when the students presented it to the committees, they were able to proactively take away many of the potential arguments or questions people might have by making, uh, by uh, addressing those issues right up front. And that was, uh, uh, was clearly highly effective there. And what we also f uh, found was, uh, although the ma vast majority of uh, 911 systems in Virginia did not have texting ability, not a single one of them was willing to come say they didn't want to, uh, to follow through one thing. So they, they, weren't, they weren't going to oppose the bill here. That was certainly helpful. Yeah, I'll mention this bill too. So this is the bill that passed in 2016. And this was a bill um, that prohibited universities and secondary um, education from demanding that students turn over their usernames and passwords to their private social media accounts. And I mention this one because um, some of the best bill ideas we found are students come to me and they say, um, they say, you know, is this a good idea? And I say, well, isn't that already a law? or why does that need to be a law? So this student brought it to me and I said, well, yeah, that seems pretty much an infringement of um, the student's privacy, but is this a problem? And it turns out that, um, and you might already know this, I didn't, that a lot of coaches, um, if, even sometimes as soon as students commit in high school, will have them turn over their usernames and passwords, not just friend them or accept friend requests, but actually give them their username and password so they can see deep into their social media accounts. And you might think that that is for safety reasons, and maybe sometimes it is, um, and maybe that maybe that would make it justifiable if it was, you know, are you hazing and are you drinking and things like that. But a lot of times they're looking for criticism of the athletic programs um, and questioning coaches' decisions or calling out other players or something like that. Um, so this was the bill that passed in 2016, which protects um, college students' privacy in their personal accounts. So, uh, and and that one um, was amended a little bit because of the, um, I don't know if you remember this, but I think it was two Virginia Tech students murdered a like 13 year old or something like that, that they found on a social media account. And, um, and some of the people in the, in the House of Delegates were concerned that this might um, somehow infringe on a police officer's ability to look into, um, to, to investigate criminal uh, you know, accusations. And it probably wouldn't have, but to be safe, that part was added about, about that. But that's another example of a bill that was, was passed. And, often, and, and sometimes uh, I've been able to get legislation passed, just not the first year. And sometimes I need more help uh, to get it passed uh, in subsequent years. Uh, one of those was uh, the students came up with a proposal for dealing with texting while driving. Uh, 
uh, and they, it was easy for them to come up with ideas since among the, the uh, most frequent uh, users of texting while driving are teenagers because uh, they text all the time. In fact, my daughter, who was taught by Kathy at Mount Vernon High School, uh, has been a teacher in the South Bronx for a number of years. Uh, and basically, her message to her parents, my wife and me, is uh, text first, and only if that doesn't work can you call me. So, uh, uh, so you know, that's, that's certainly a big issue. Uh, we did not get it through the first year, but then I teamed up with uh, Delegate Anderson and a couple of others, and we uh, worked on it for many years, and eventually we did get legislation passed that addressed it, and we're looking at tweaking some of that right now in, in the General Assembly, and some uh, further changes may occur in the next couple of years, all related to something that was started by students at Centerville High School. I think there was one on radon, radon testing in home daycare centers too, and it turns out that that didn't need to be actual legislation. It was passed as a regulation. So it did get enacted. It just didn't have to go through the legislative process. Okay, so this list right here is a list of, um, of, of suggestions that we sent to Senator Barker. So what the government teachers um, at my school did is we all brought what we thought um, be best met, met Senator Barker's needs to the table, and we kind of like lobbied for our students. We said, hey, I've got this great one. And that's why you saw this year we had a, we had a group of four students because Terry Ritchie, the other teacher in the video, she had two students who had a very similar bill to my students, and so we combined them. They were both about texting um, 911. They saw similar. Uh, they found similar, you know, articles that made them go in that direction. Uh, but these are some of the other ideas, just so um, you can see sort of the breadth of ideas out there. And some of them came from people's personal experiences, um, like the one about the personal flotation devices. That person was um, vacationing on Lake Anna or something like that, and, you know, they had to wear... Um, they didn't have to wear a flotation device, and they found out, I, I don't know, remember all the details, but there are certain body of waters where people under the age of 16 do, they some they don't, and they thought that was kind of silly, it's water. Like if you can't, if you have to wear a flotation device in this kind of water, you should probably have to wear a flotation device in that kind of water, and that just came out of their personal experiences. Um, and then do you want to say anything about why you chose the one you chose out of this list? Because I would be curious what that answer is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, there were a couple of the others that are up here that I did seriously look at. Uh, they had three or four good ideas this past year. And so I did have multiple bills drafted initially, but then, uh, you know, had got all the, got the detailed information in terms of what the, the research the students had done to be able to understand some of the, the, the uh, issues behind it. And, what's, uh, and also what some of the costs would be with some of these. And it was, uh, in the end, it came clear to me that this was something that would make a big difference in certain situations, uh, was something that I felt was necessary and that there were a lot of systems in Virginia that don't, or certainly didn't at the time, have the capability to, to handle the text. Uh, and it was not prohibitively expensive. Uh, in fact, there was no upfront equipment costs. There were some training costs for the staff to be able to do things, but that was it was all would be incurred by the, by the system. So. Uh, this, it was, it, there, although there were several good ones, this uh, clearly in my sense was the one that we were most likely to be able to get through with a significant impact, positive impact on the, on the uh, Commonwealth as a whole. And, uh, and, and certainly we, we, we aced it this year, so. <laughs> Okay, so the next one is we, um, we've every year taken the students whose bills make it as far as, as committee, which I guess is all of them, yeah, um, to, um, to Richmond, and that becomes a trip in and of itself. So the next slide is on the actual committee work, and I'll have um, Senator Barker talk about this. But, you know, most of our students, because we're the whole way up in Fairfax, have never been to their state capitol. So um, it's exciting for them just to come to Richmond. Um, last year, we ran into Governor Northam, like right after his inauguration days, that was Jan mid January, um, he was just happened to be at a um, at a pro um, choice rally out on the grounds of the of the Capitol building, and um, we just walked up to him and said, "Hey, can we get a picture with you?" So um, so just even coming to Richmond is a is a big deal for for the students. Um, and, and here I thought they came down to Richmond to see me. So. <laughs> well, they did. That's, that's this slide. So I'll let you talk about this one. So then, the, so after we get to Richmond, one of the things we do is we go to Senator Barker's office, and he does some prep with them so they know what to look, what they're up against in committee. Yeah, and one of the things uh, I've done uh, consistently throughout the process or throughout the years is uh, I don't go in and just present the bill to the committee. 
I go in and set the stage and start the presentation, but the meat of the presentation is made by the students themselves. And uh, that puts them in a position where they have to prepare for what they're gonna present. Uh, one of the things that almost every year I have to say to the students is, you need to shorten what you're gonna say. <laughs> These are legislators. We don't have long attention spans. So, uh, uh, you know, you, the, all, all of what you say is great and it's a justification for your bill and everything, but uh, the committee has a lot of bills to deal with this afternoon, and so you need to shorten your, your remarks just a little bit. So take a little red pen out and line out a few sentences here and there. Uh, but they do, uh, you know, the presentations vary a little bit in terms of uh, how good they are, but some of these presentations these students have done have just been phenomenal, and there clearly were some that did an outstanding job this year as well, which certainly helped along with the committee chair then rallying to the bill and making sure everybody else voted for it. So. And I just have to point out, because I can tell that you guys are like my tribe, that I did break, my hand was broken this year, and I do have a red, white, and blue stars and stripe cast on my hand, so I just want some like bonus points for, for the cast there. Um, so this student, we haven't talked about much, this student was from, from 2016, his name is Assis Sekhan, and I'll just mention him because um, while this other group had four students, he did his bill alone, because that's just kind of how, how he, he rolled. He didn't really want to do the partner thing. Um, he was super quiet, not very outgoing, a, a pretty, you know, it was just as far as letter grades go, a pretty average student. So it was really awesome for him to have the limelight and really get this experience, and, and when um, one of the things we'll talk about in a second is, while this is all going on, the students in the classroom are really following these students' journey, journeys. While they can't all go, only one bill gets picked, we're all watching what's happening. And so um, for him to be the center of attention was, was really cool and a really big deal for him. Um, okay. So if we can try to do, we're gonna try to play you some audio. This is off um, Senator Barker's uh, Facebook page. And um, from, the, from the date, we're gonna try to do the same thing with the audio. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Arkham Mazunder. I'm here to talk about why this, where this bill has been successful and why. First, I'd like to assert that this bill is beneficial for victims involved in kidnapping, sexual assault, sexual assault or abusive situations. And I'd like to fully assert that any misuse of a 911 text message we followed through using, according to the Virginia Code, any abuse via text message will also face the same punishments as someone who abuses the 911 service for uh, calling as well. Uh, I would also like to reiterate what my associate tried to say with the four U.S. wireless carriers in the sense that AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint committed that by that ever since 2014 they would make text 911 services available in all networks in all counties. I have some data from the FCC stating how many counties already have the 911 text service available. In Arizona, they have 136. In Alaska, Alaska, they have 177. In California, they have 591. In Texas, they have 674. But in Virginia, even though we, only, even though we have 119 counties, only 35 to 36 have the text 911 services available. So we believe that, along with the sender and the rest of my associates, that it's imperative to have the 70 to 80 PSAP PSAP services upgrades to the latest technology with a fraction of the cost. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. Senator Barker. You brought a, brought a well-versed crowd with you. Uh, I did, and, and one of you even wearing that pink tie. So. All right. So. Is, is, there, is, is there, is there, Senator Norm, is there anyone opposed to this fine piece of legislation? <laughs> it's been moved and seconded that the bill be reported. Clerk, open the rolls. Close the roll. 13 ayes, zero nays. Okay. Thank two for two. Sure. Yes. Well done. Thank you. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> And I will tell you that, so it's about, a, in morning traffic, about a two-hour drive from Northern Virginia, and I had all four of them in my car with me, and um, they practiced for two hours. We, and I shot questions at them. You heard how many questions they got, right? I was peppering them with questions, like they were being cross-examined, and then they got no questions. <laughs> it was a pretty friendly yeah. crowd, but, <laughs> but that, was a lot of, that was a lot of preparation. He's a pretty remarkable student anyway, but it was also a lot of preparation. And Many times uh, what you also get is some of their parents will come down uh, and often their parents have never been to Richmond, they've certainly never been to the Capitol, 
and never seen these types of things. Uh, and sometimes if they don't have enough notice to be able to come down the day that the bill is being presented to the committee, if we're able to get the bill through, they'll definitely make it down when they uh, do the ceremony signing with the governor uh, there. So, uh, and actually in, in Northern Virginia, given the uh, school that we're dealing with here, a lot of the students are first and second generation uh, Americans. And so they're bringing in, helping educate their parents and their siblings on the whole political process uh, in the United States and in Virginia at the same time as they're learning it. So I mentioned, um, and this is the more simple of the bills, that I would, that the whole school follows it through the process. This is the legislative history from the 911 bill, which sailed through and you can still see how many steps it had to go through so we all cyber stocked this bill we were always we were watching it and watching it and, and poor Steve in Senator Barker's office he got lots of emails like what's happening now and uh, so the whole school was really involved in, in sort of cheerleading it on through the process um, and I didn't put the one up from um, the social media one because that one got amended in the house and had to go back through the Senate and so it's legislation legislative history is like this long so it would have been too small to even read at that point the, the other thing I will say is I'm gonna get some of these students to help me they got a lot more media coverage than I ever do on any of my oh, bills so yeah there's a, there's a slide on that Senator Barker <laughs> okay so this is what Senator Barker was just talking about with the ceremonial signing so this happens um, much later after the fact um, the social media bill was actually signed on April 1st I remember because it was April Fool's Day and I was a little afraid to believe it was true and the students were a little hesitant to believe I was telling them the truth um, and then our ceremonial signing was was in after graduation. So it takes a little while, but we eventually get to come down and, uh, and meet the governor, Gover Governor McAuliffe and Governor uh, Northam. They get pens to, you know, to show off for the rest of their lives. I have one too. Uh, um, and as a bonus, as Senator Barker was just saying, um, it is really good press. Uh, it's good press for Senator Barker, and hopefully if you're thinking about instituting something like this, you could use that as a selling point. It's good press for the school. Um, I ended up last year winning a, an award from the American Lawyers Alliance that, that I think had a lot to do with that and won the year before from um, from the John Marshall Foundation, which I think had a lot to do with these things. So um, so it's it's sort of a win-win-win for everyone involved. Um, so that's just one. That was a Washington Post one. I also can now say I am a, a published photographer because that's my like cell phone picture <laughs> in the Washington Post. So. Um, but we had, you saw the WJLA thing, we were on WTOP, lots of other media outlets. So they were kind of, um, f they were kind of internet famous for a while, so. Okay, and we're happy to take any questions, if you have any questions for Hal. Yes. Did you show, did you show what the students like, have to continue as far as what they have? Internet. Yeah, I, I didn't because um, cause I gave them back, maybe foolishly. Um, but essentially, they, they have a format where they just say, like, this is what the bill will do. This is our rationale for why it's needed. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about was what other states have done. And that's a good thing. Like, you know, for instance, the 911, lots of states have had it be mandatory for a long time. Um, so Virginia doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. In fact, I'm pretty sure Virginia isn't always on the cutting edge of social issues, so. Um, Not often, so. <laughs> um, so, so basically it was a one page, like this is what the bill will do, this is the research, um, this is what we project the cost to be. And the projected cost is very much a, you know, guesstimate. Like one of the times um, somebody did a bill, uh, they had gone to Pennsylvania and saw that in Pennsylvania the stop signs often t uh, recently had um, red reflective tape put down the poles. And it was just sort of so people start to notice the stop signs again or make them a little more visible. And it's a pretty cheap fix because it's just essentially reflective tape down the you know, the, the vertical pole. Um, and so they tried to extrapolate, you know, if there are how many stop signs there might be in Virginia and then how much it might cost to have this little strip. So, but generally they're one page long. Yeah, and, and also uh, during the process, you talked about finding out whether other states have uh, implemented the same law or similar uh, proposals there. Uh, but we also 
make sure they understand that sometimes there are political ramifications for what you say. And if you want to get your bill passed, the one, one of the things you do not say is that this bill is passed in California, New York, and Massachusetts. <laughs> if you do that, you're dead, so. So you gotta be careful about how you phrase these things. So. Other questions? Yes. Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, Senator Barker's deadline for us was usually um, the Thanksgiving break-ish, or right around there, um, because of when the session starts and ends. So we would start almost at the, I'm sorry, I'm like peeking through here. We, was, we would start almost at the beginning of the school year with just the idea of this is coming. Um, the writing itself didn't really take that long, so it's you know maybe a day in the library for research. Um, and then I think the regular classes maybe spend a day or two typing them up. In AP, frankly, my kids, we didn't have time for that. They did it on their own, but we did a lot of like the brainstorming together. So for the teacher, the biggest amount of time it takes is, I will say, very few students hit it out of the park the first time around. Um, so there is a lot of like the drafts back and forth. And I was thinking um, before I retired that if I did it again this year, I might do it more with like a discussion board kind of thing where like it's really easy to get back and forth without you know having to pass a paper back and forth um, and some time built into class to talk, help kids talk through ideas um, because a lot of times like I said they want to they want to eat the elephant in one bite so you might have to talk them into you know something a little more practical so I, w I would say from the beginning of the school just thinking you know keep your eyes open keep your ears open because like finding a good idea is the hardest part and they just need to kind of open their poss themselves up to possibilities. And the time it takes to sort of get from idea to uh, having a real proposal is uh, a lot less than it used to be. When I was in high school in the 1960s, we didn't have Google, so uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so they, they actually can you know pull together a good bit of information in a short period of time to be able to f help figure out whether something's credible. And I and I it was up there, but I didn't say it out loud. Um, our librarians were infinitely helpful on this. So we involved them in the process and they put together a, um, a research sheet on the, on the website for the, for the media center for the library that had a whole bunch of databases, issues and controversies, um, you know, all sorts of things like that and, um, and, is, and the Virginia legislative page um, and they were, and the, it helped the students enormously to be able to go there and sort of research off that, so librarians are huge help. I don't know if we have librarians in the house, but you know how great they are, so. Yes. Do you know if there are any um, other uh, legislators that are doing the same thing, or is this something kind of unique to your office? Uh, in terms of doing it every year, it is fairly unique. There are a lot of bills that do come to the General Assembly that are brought forward by student, uh, student groups but usually sort of more of something they've been talking about or something that a class was focused on just at one time. Uh, so we'll get, we, get, we get bills on the, uh, uh, a designation of the state toad or whatever, uh, and so, so we get a lot of those types of things from elementary school students, but we do get some others from uh, high school students as well that are clearly much more substantive or, oriented there. Uh, and often it's, you know, a class is doing something or a kid has an idea and somehow they get in touch with a legislator. And so there are a fair number of those that do come through. But I'm, I think I'm pretty unique in terms of sort of having a consistent uh, process here every year with the same students at the same school. Hi there. Uh, two questions. Um, sure. The first one, we're just talking, my colleague and I, uh, about, um, I mean, you have AP government students and we teach middle school civics. Um, I teach honors and advanced, and uh, Mr. Dressel here has uh, standard level and in honors and advanced. Uh, for those students who uh, might struggle with this kind of an assignment, we want, we want to find a way to make this worth it, even to those students whose ideas might be rejected. Mm -hmm. Do you offer any sort of, or do you know legislators who would at least send something back to those students, just as, as a verification that, you know, you were at least heard, even if we ultimately decided not to follow through with your, with your idea. And then my other question is, do you think legislators will be more um, interested in doing this 
next year when they're up for re-election? <laughs> uh, on the last question, I would say yes. Uh, so, uh, nothing, nothing like a close election. And uh, I've, I'm the only Virginia legislator who's won more than once and has never gotten to 54% of the vote. So uh, I am one who obviously has to pay attention to everybody. Uh, but uh, clearly, I think legislators, uh, you know, when they're up, are, are going to be uh, wanting to make a good impression with uh, people uh, throughout the process. Uh, and I guarantee you a great way to, to make a good impression uh, is to talk to the kids, and then they talk to their parents, and then the parents sort of sign on to things. And I still hear occasionally from uh, parents uh, who had kids who had one of the bills that got selected uh, some year, s several years back. Uh, so it does sort of establish a rapport there that would not otherwise have been there in, in some of these situations. What I think you also can count on is that uh, there are legislators who do make an effort to get out to a lot of schools. Uh, it's something that a lot of us do, certainly Delegate Anderson when he was in the legislature. Uh, I think he visited virtually every school in his district at one time or another there. So. Uh, got around it and did those types of things. And even if you don't have a formal thing where they're actually having a bill drafted and then presented, uh, you can sort of set up mock sessions and have them participate in it and do things like that that I think can be very meaningful as well. Yes? In case, and I'm sure other people have done it, but they do the mock legislation when you take the class trip to the Capitol. Our students from Gloucester participate right. every year and they get to do at the cap in the class trips free, you're just paying for your buses. Right. Good. Behind. I would also urge teachers to think about different audiences, whether it's your town council, your board of supervisors, your school board meetings, um, even school administrators. I have worked with a superintendent's student advisory council. Um, where he is very interested in getting input from students on different issues that the school system has to grapple with. Um, you'd also be surprised at how many school administrators don't talk to kids. Um, so think about not just state legislation, but also other audiences as well. There are some organizations out there too. Um, street law is not one of them, but Mikva Challenge and Citizen, what is it? Somebody's gonna know. Project Citizen, thank you. Um, that you can, that, that actually sell curriculum and things like that, aimed at all sorts of different audiences and have um, not quite as an authentic audience as a lawmaker who might make your bill actual law, but they have um, sort of like science fair kind of uh, competitions for legislation and things like that. So I'm not super familiar with them. I've done a little bit of research on them, but not endorsing them, just saying they're out there if you are looking for some kind of actually already pre-made curriculum. Well, one, one thing that uh, is coming up this next year, uh, starting in, uh, in January of 2019, is that we are going to be celebrating the 400th anniversary of the first state legislature uh, in, in, in America. Uh, the House of Burgesses that got established and met in Jamestown in, in 1619. Uh, there is a whole celebration that's going to be going on during, during, 16, uh, during 2019 to celebrate that 400th anniversary, uh, maybe not quite as big as what we did in, uh, uh, in 2007 when we celebrated the, uh, the landing here in, uh, in 1607. But there are a lot of things that are done there and there is a whole thing and there are some curriculum things that can be used in schools that, at elementary, middle school, and high school levels, all three. Uh, I think it's American evolution, not revolution, is how it's being uh, marketed, and certainly through the uh, uh, Department of Education here, you can get information on that as well, so. And they had a display here. They did, okay, good, great. Okay, well, thank you very much, and if you have any questions, we'll be around for a while, so just ask, thanks. Thank you so much.